Thanks for listening to the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. And we appreciate you subscribing as well. In this episode, uh, number 196, Jose and I discuss Hunters in the Snow, a previously unreleased play that you can order from the Clive Barker archive. Do you have yours yet? Uh, There will be some spoilers, but we love it if you can read the play and send us your thoughts and comments. Hey, welcome to episode 196 uh, of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, Today we're going to be discussing uh, uh, one of Clive Barker's play scripts that came out from the Clive Barker archive. It's called Hunters in the Snow. And as usual, I'm Joe, and we got Ryan. Hey! So... Yeah, it's, it's been a while since we've done a a play script. Um, yeah. we still we still have some from the the uh, original play script books that came out um, in the '90s, like Incarnations of Forms of Heaven, that we haven't gotten to. But these are something else, right? These play scripts from the Clive Barker archive are really really amazing, and they come packed with lots of information and pictures from the '70s. Yeah. So, how did you like Hunters in the Snow? I thought it was great. At first, I was a little, su- I was actually a little, really surprised that it was a musical, you know, a musical play. And then it's like, you know, by the time you get to the end of a scene, they would, like, a, an actor will say, "Oh, well, I have a song about that," or a character is like, <laughs> "Oh, just a second, yeah. I, I have a song to sing about that." Which right, you know, and and, uh, and it was funny reading reading Phil and Sarah's notes, uh, their their uh, their afterward. At the end, um, the the people recounting this this time, you know, said, you know, it didn't bother Clive at all that we had no experience <laughs> doing a musical play. He just wanted to, you know, blast forward and and uh, and push on and and just and do it and and see see how we like it. So it seems like this piece um, they wrote it in '73 and it got um, played just for two days at the Everyman Theater. It was, I think, uh, April 9 and April 16 of 1973. So um, there's lots of pictures in here of Clive Barker as Jerusalem, who's the artist in the story. And uh, I think he was very influenced by the paintings of uh, Peter uh, Bruegel. Bruegel? I don't know how to pronounce that. (laughs) But uh, uh, especially one painting that's called Hunters in the Snow. So uh, 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 Bruegel um, made a bunch of paintings. Some of them were depicting different um, seasons. And so you have some like the gloomy day, the harvesters, the hay harvest, hunters in the snow, and the return of the herd. So they're very striking pieces. And um, um, that really impressed uh, Clive Barker when he was working on this. And he also was impressed by another Bruegel painting, which was called, I believe, uh, The Magpie and the Gallows. So that's that's another painting that right, uh, right. and there's a song yeah. about a magpie on on gallows at the start of the play. Right, right. Um, so it's interesting because I guess it's such a striking uh, symbolism of having a magpie on top of some gallows, which means that they're getting ready to snack on someone's eyes or someone's yeah. tongue, you know, some some corpse. And I think it's horrifying because it makes us think of ourselves as food <laughs> yeah. as inanimate corpses that are just subject to being, you know, uh, predated upon by animals and stuff. So yeah. I think in that sense, the magpie, of course, always represents death and decay and, uh, and, uh, that sort of thing. Um, of course, when connected to the gallows, that's, that's even stronger. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, the whole, the whole first act of this play is all, um, it's it's about war and you know the capriciousness and and uh, arbitrariness of of war right i mean it, the, this war started out because two kings were just kind of strolling around in a field and pretending like oh yeah i just like to visit this particular field and and <laughs> <laughs> right it's the king of uh, messenia which mm-hmm. actually is a real place it's an ancient location in greece oh. uh and then another king from let's see what was the he from i looked it up that place never existed but he was king selenius and king gallifron uh, yeah alt altofia or altofia yeah. yeah and so basically uh yeah that 
the the opening is very simple, like you said, and, and yet very clever. So it's it's it depicts how wars happen throughout history. You know, uh, bullies get power, they gather an army, and then they fight for resources. That's the human condition, right there. Yeah. Um, and I, I like the songs. Um, the musical play, I, I liked. I appreciated the songs. Reminded me a little bit of some of the uh, William Blake's songs of uh, innocence, yeah, and experience. And there's even like at the end here, there's um, a part where one of the characters, I believe he is the hunchback, hunchback um, clown. Mm -hmm. He does something which is he kind of makes a a little song that's basically. Uh, reinterpretation of Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night by William Blake. Yeah, right. So, so you, yeah, so you can see that. I was trying to locate that. I'll it, find it later. One thing about the, that's kind of lost in time, I guess, is is the way that the the songs were supposed to be. You know, the 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 way the melody was supposed to go. It would be nice to be able to hear them. You right. Know, so instead I think, of inventing in our minds how you know how the how the melody goes yeah i did try that i was kind of like mumbling them in my mind like trying to see how would how would the metric flow how would yeah. how, what sort of song would this be because some of them have long verses but then it it uh, switches to like shorter verses and yeah. i'm thinking how would the music change here but uh, but it's like reading tolkien he did that too he, every once in a while there'd be a uh, an elven song or something and yeah i don't really yeah. know exactly how it how the melody on that would go either mm-hmm um, so I think that Julie Blake worked on the piano for some of these songs. And then Roy Barker, Clive Barker's own brother, he played the guitar. So he kind of made these little simplistic chords that uh, so they worked on together to make these little songs. And, he, and they apparently it worked. Of, they said they were kind of folksy or like folk songs. Yeah, like kind of almost medieval. Mm. Um, I could see that. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, I think when the characters sing those songs, it's like they're um, – I could see like the light focusing on the character and then – it's like you're getting a window into the soul of the character, right? They sing yeah. about their condition, their view of the world, what's going on, except for one character that has no songs. He's the Dutchman and yeah. he was played by um, Doug Bradley, right? Yeah, yeah the, the Dutchman is a really interesting, really creepy kind of character. I mean he, he has nightmares surrounding him wherever he goes. His shadow – uh, his shadow like causes the ground to decompose beneath him. Um, yeah, and, and if you compare it to certain, oh, go ahead. There, there's something demonic about him. I mean, which is which really plays into the the themes of this play. You know that the idea of of uh, the corruption of the church and and uh, or the organized religion being the true evil. You know, even to the point of of uh, hiring some kind of demonic force. To find someone and can and accuse them of being a witch, which is uh, really interesting. Well, it's something that Clyde Barker has done before, right? And when you go to Frankenstein in Love, there's also a cardinal, and uh, he's in cahoots with with you know the the powers that be. So there's always this promiscuity between the clergy and 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 the ruling class, and this one's no different. So except this cardinal may not even be a cardinal to begin with. Um, and I, I don't want to spoil too much, but this this guy is, is basically the cardinal is just uh, a guy who found himself in a position where he could uh, fill in the shoes for someone else. And yeah. um, and so he is, as usual, um, the state and the church always use their uh, economic power to commission artists to solidify their their power, right? Their status quo. So um, in this case, so basically the story is that this war has been going on for a long time. And it, it, one funny thing, is they mentioned the snow falling, but it's actually at the beginning of the play, it may be ash because this, the, the city has been burning for over a year, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is, is complete exaggeration. But um, but then it, it does switch into the winter, and then I do believe that this is snow. But uh, it's interesting, that idea of ash falling, uh, looking like snow. It's a, It's a very striking image and i'm always reminded of the uh, spielberg movie um shindo's list where people go outside one day um near a concentration camp and uh some guy puts his hand on his car and 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 thinks that there's there's snow falling but it's actually ash 
from the crematoriums that's been falling over the city that's near the concentration camp. So that's always a, a very striking image to see ash fall down in a city. Always depicts some sort of cataclysm happening, whether had, it's a volcano. I had an experience like that in Japan after the earthquake in '95. The they were Kobe. Burning, yeah, they were burning bodies in a school gym. And oh my I, god, I, that's horrible! I thought it was snowing, but it was ash. Oh my god, that's that's I don't I don't even know what to what to say. <laughs> That is terrible. I'm sorry you went through that, Thanks. but yeah, that's uh, you got to do the what, what's called the uh, the uh, field post mortem, the field morgues, because people are just being dug out of the rubble, and yeah. you got to do a quick yeah. cursory uh, autopsy and and make sure they're they're put away quickly before people start getting sick, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't have the capacity to deal with it, and it was 6,000 people died. That's amazing. And I saw the other day you posted that you found your old student uh, ID when you were <laughs> right. Right. packing stuff to move your house, yeah. that you found your old Kobe student ID, and you look completely different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer had saved all of my old IDs and stuff in a photo album, and I didn't realize or I'd forgotten about it. Oh, that's cool. So... There's this war going on, and then there's this artist. His name is Jerusalem. I think it, early versions of this, he was supposed to be called Peter, as in Peter Bruegel. Right, named uh, after the he, artist that made the, that's a, And maybe they decided that was too on the nose, or <laughs> I don't know. Right, yeah. So anyway, there's the artist, and then he's he's a, one of those artists that believes that there is some potential in, in the humankind, um, even though he also believes that most of us never get to achieve that potential. But he, he wants to, to keep the hope alive in people that we can elevate ourselves into, not gods exactly, but that we can achieve some sort of divinity within ourselves. And, um, of course, the church doesn't like that. The church wants us all to think that we're horrible sinners, that we're all, all going to hell. Right. And the only way we can, we can escape hell is to give money to the church. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and mm -hmm. it's really it's really kind of the, by the end of the play, um, it's really kind of ironic the way that uh, that his view of the world kind of comes to be that a common person gets elevated to a saint. Right, right. Um, of course, there's there's a trial of a couple of soldiers and they're being executed, and then one of them escapes, and um, and then. Um, it's an interesting thing. I was reading about this, the, the executioner and the way that he talks about his work yeah. being an art, <laughs> yeah, right? He, he had a song about, about hanging yeah. people and you should be grateful that I do such a good job. And I'm trying to imagine uh, the executioner with a big black hood on his head uh, singing a song about caressing your neck with his noose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember reading a book once. Um, it was about... When uh, uh, Paris started uh, uh, after the revolution, they were beheading people left and right. And so they had the, the capital punishment, right? They had the guillotine that was created by Dr. Guillotine, uh, who will forever live in infamy, I guess. Yeah. But the thing is, they eventually refined the position of the executioner to become a dynasty thing. And there was a dynasty of Parisian executor, executioners. Yes. Yeah. His, the, the family name was Sanson, and it went from father to son, and um, they, they had a good life. They had a good job. They got paid handsomely. They had their own house and everything, and uh, it was a, a family craft um, wow. until, until pretty late when they, they stopped doing that. They stopped using the guillotine, and that wasn't until the 20th century, so you, you, you could probably, you know, late in the 20th century, so... Um, Can you imagine having a kid and being like, okay, and now I'm going to teach you the craft of cutting people's heads off? Yeah, yeah, they they did that. Um, that's that's pretty impressive. Uh, uh, luckily, I'm not I'm not going to get into a big uh, a discussion about capital punishment, but I, you know, I don't think that that's a, a necessity anymore. I don't think that has a particularly uh, dissuasive effect on on crime. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's – back then, they created a whole dynasty of executioners in Paris. So that's always interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and um, 
So back to the play, the the first half of the play is, like I was saying, is more about war and, and uh, corruption and, and uh, people trying to seize power in the, in the uh, you know, filling the, the vacuum created by all the death. And the, 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 the wives of the, you know, husbands w wondering where their husbands are. And the, the song they sing to the magpie is all about, um, you know, hey, magpie, is my is my husband you know dead or is he going to come back and and i think does the mag the magpie doesn't answer like i think they sing the song somehow they figure it out from the song that oh no he he died he froze to death in the snow or something like that right 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 it's basically just this this uh depiction of of uncertainty right like the yeah. people don't know what's going on they they don't know where their loved ones are. It's mentioned here at one point that every family in this in this kingdom probably had some soldier out in the war and probably some dead parent uh, or, or or son in this war as well. So like Frankenstein in Love, it's one of those plays that takes place in this time of turmoil and catastrophe and, and war, perpetual war that's been going on for as long as people remember. Um, and it's it's a beacon of hope that Jerusalem thinks that he can elevate people through art. He uh, he's willing to make that his mission. Um, so and, and he takes over a fresco uh, painting in a church that his father had started. So right. So it's become yeah. kind of it was his father's life's work, and it's become his life's work. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting how the cardinal at one point uh decides to call upon him so he sends like a soldier to say hey you know the cardinal wants you to go to the palace because your your art has uh reached some people and they don't like what you're doing but they want to commission something from you because they they see that you're talented so he has to go there and he has to go to the city and he has a safe passage but that doesn't really mean much because just like uh, Zalim on his way to Samarkand yeah. in Galilee, Jerusalem gets assaulted by robbers on the road and he's left for dead, right? Yeah, Bef and they, they take everything he has, including his safe passage paper. Yeah. It's almost as if before reaching the seat of power, the character must always arrive stripped of his dignity and any material goods that he has. Um, yeah. And that way, when he's completely – he would be completely dependent of the favors of the cardinal – but I guess this is where his morality is put on trial, because he could become rich accepting the commission, but but Jerusalem is kind of a genuine artist that feels like he's serving that higher purpose. So yeah. his mission is to maintain that hope that men can achieve more, and um, he and, denies he denies the the cardinal. Well, and not he doesn't just not only does he deny him, but he he uh, he dislikes him, and he he openly says you know how what a terrible person he is, and that he's ungodly and and the cardinal you know is kind of amused by it and thinks like yeah mm -hmm. you know I, I i'm not a i'm not a theologian i don't you know and he's he pretty much says i'm kind of an atheist and i don't really care about religion I, he cares about order and and his own position yeah he denies him his power because he knows that deep down the cardinal is not really a cardinal and so he talks to him as he would talk to someone who is not above him in any sort of station and he says, you know what? I'm going to expose you for the fraud that you are. And um, and so, yeah. But uh, that 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 mission and this trial of him going there and having to go to the palace and having to be confronted by this idea that you do what I say or I'm going to destroy you. And then he just becomes a subversive. He says, no, no, I'm going to destroy you. Yeah. I'm going to go around telling people how much of a bad person you are. That you're and for some reason, the cardinal— a grave robber and— yeah. And for some reason, the cardinal says, OK, well, you're just one crazy guy. You know, I don't care. You can go go on and do whatever you got to do. Just get out of here. Yeah, I'm not threatened by you. Yeah, but he is. Uh -huh. <laughs> he really is. Yeah, and uh, Because he hires the Dutchman Shudder. Yeah. The, which is there's some supernatural stuff that comes into the second act. Right. We've got the Dutchman. And also uh, we, we, that we described a little bit ago that the, you know was was someone killed on a battlefield and resurrected by this hunchback clown uh, named Codpiece. Right, Codpiece so, of all yeah. things. So it seems to me that Codpiece is probably some kind of a demon. Right, that's what I got to, if not even the actual devil. Mm -hmm. um, I got that idea from this. 
And also, there's a hint that um, this Dutchman might have been working in the land, in this land of perpetual war, with the horsemen. And it seems like they might be the horsemen of the apocalypse. So oh. at, at some point, yeah, I got this idea. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, but I got this idea that, yeah, this might have some sort of connection here with the horsemen of the apocalypse, even though he never really brings that to uh, back into a more open mention. But um, yeah. Well, and he even tries to ask Codpiece the Clown, like, what are you... You know, what is it that makes me alive? Why do I move? You know, what's what's make it, causing me to move? And then they get interrupted and it never, you know, they never come back to it. But uh, yeah. I guess that's up to the audience's imagination. But it seems to me that they're kind of moved by this demonic power. And and they're also really corrupt. I mean, their, their witch trials are all basically forcing, you know, if you, you forcing people to create uh, evidence and create... Um, testimony that they just lie they just lie and make it up and if you don't i'll kill you i think i saw him not as doug bradley but i saw him more in my mind as the witch finder general uh played by vincent price because mm. he's got that that puritan dutchman kind of like look to him yeah 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 I, so I that's was, i was thinking of the the puritan from uh from the damnation game too yeah mamoulian yeah. sure he also walks with uh, the shadows following him, right? There's one time in Damnation Game, I believe, where there's this vision of that tree in the darkness. Yeah. You remember that part? Yeah. The tree that has the the flowers falling down. It looks like snow. And then and then you see this idea of, of this vague, uh, disembodied character walking and then darkness following in his path is present in the Damnation Game it's also present in the last illusion where that that uh, a monster is walking down the streets towards uh, swan and you see the shadow is like lapping at his feet and it's making the street darker as he walks yeah remember that yeah i do yeah and then there's christopher carrion as well who also has his nightmares coiled around his gigantic collar yeah <laughs> just like the dutchman collar right except this one's turned up and it's like like a tank where his yeah. nightmares are just fishing around. So you keep getting these ideas that Clyde Barker keeps bringing back, but mm -hmm. almost like encoded in different forms. But if you kind of look at these things, put them side by side, sometimes you see that there is kind of this thematic connection between all these characters, right? Yeah. Oh, and there was something also in there afterward about the Dutchman, the character of the Dutchman in Clive's direction. He says, you know, Dougie, I want you to say this line as if the North Wind were blowing through your eyes. And I thought yeah. that, I thought that was attributed to Hellraiser. I didn't uh, know that that, that came comes, from the Dutchman. Right. So if you have the Clive Barker Shadows in Eden book, um, there's a, a really cool interview that uh, – Let's see. It's it's on chapter thirteen. It's called "The Dog's Tale" mm -hmm. by Peter Atkins, and it's uh, he starts talking about the early summer of seventy four, and then he talks about the Hydra Theater and the Dog Company, and then there's also Phil Rimmer and Clyde Barker and Peter Atkins and whoever else is in here, Lynn Darnell, Doug Bradley, and I really recommend you read this because they talk about all these plays that they did, and one of them was. Hunters in the Snow, and it says something about um, – says something here. Um, they were discovering fantasy at the time in 73. Uh, they were starting to read Alan Garner, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, like you brought up, um, uh, E.R. Edison and Dunsany. And so they were doing musicals. And he says, Hunters in the Snow had songs, songs by me, songs by Phil, songs by Julie Blake, and even a couple by my brother. And then he talks about um, – so he talks about uh, the character I played. This is Doug Bradley talking. The character I played in The Hunters, the Dutchman. I can see echoes of later. And Barker says, yes, Mamoulian in the Damnation game. And Bradley says, well, I was going to say even Pinhead in Hellraiser, this strange, strange character whose head was kind of empty, but who conveyed all kinds of things. I remember, laughs, getting the best note ever from a director, Clive, when I was the Dutchman. Clive said, Dougie, I want you to say this line as if the north wind was blowing through your eyes. And Barker laughs and says, God, I'm going to give that kind of direction more and more. 
So that's that's yeah. a so that's, that's a cool the, mention here. Yeah, the origin of that. That's interesting. But yeah, he did. He 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 definitely kept playing Pinhead in the same way. It was like do less, you know. Yeah, do less because of the makeup, and not just that, also because of his performance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And let's see, there's also some mention of that in uh, Clyde Barker's The Dark Fantastic. And if you go to, uh, in my copy, it's page 72. Um, they talk about, so they were doing Hunters in the Snow. Uh, because the musical influence was strong, the, the, the group at the time was called the Hydra Theater Company. And their next adventure was the creation of a fully-fledged musical named for the Bruegel painting, Hunters in the Snow, which according to the Liverpool Echo, was produced for eight pounds, which <laughs> eight pounds at the time. Yeah. So although written in the collective, Clive and Phil produced most of the words and music with the able assistance of Julie Blake, who played the piano. And for the first and only time, Roy B Barker, who played guitar and composed additional music. Wow. So uh, Clive Barker played Jerusalem and uh, um, As Salt of the Earth Farmer was played by Les Heseltine, which I think they're talking about... Um, uh, the other character, uh, his apprentice, uh, Jerusalem's apprentice, Jan, right? Right, yeah, yeah, Jan. Yeah. So I, and, have, uh, I have the Dark mm -hmm. Fantastic and um, Shadows in Eden at the other house, and I haven't read those since they came out, and I think that Shadows in Eden was like 91, and the Dark Fantastic, I think, was like 96. But I don't think I've read these since they first came out, so it's been a long time since I read those, and, and uh, at that time, none of the plays were available to read anywhere. Right. So, and then there was another play that they made after this, which was called The Wolfman, and we haven't really brought up this topic yet about Hunters in the Snow, but we'll get to that. So, The Wolfman was a version of Hunters in the Snow without the songs, and then it was reworked a little bit, and it says here, the Wolfman had developed out of a non-musical version of Hunters in the Snow called A Private Apocalypse, circa 1974, hmm. which the company had performed for another invited audience at I.M. Marsh, and which Clive entered without success in a drama com competition, and said, At play often horrific, sometimes blasphemous, occasionally very beautiful. Men into wolves, women into visions, bishops into crustacea. Perceived by some as avant-garde and others as incomprehensible, Clive refused to explain its content. A rabbit was skin on stage during the performance, which yeah. only added to the controversy. Yeah. Wow. So despite the fine audience reaction to the other performances, the Wolfman play was generally disliked and, in Clive's words, thoroughly trashed by the Daily Telegraph. Mm. Even Len and Joan Barker, Clive's parents, felt that the diverse performances were, quote, way out we came away totally confused so there you go well that's too bad i mean because hunters in the snow is is not uh it's not that avant-garde i mean it's pretty easy to follow you yeah. know other than there are some mysteries that you know don't really get solved like why uh why the main character um jerusalem can turn into a wolf in the second act of the play so it's never really said that he's turned turned into a wolf. It's said that, like after he, he after he goes through that trial with the the, the cardinal, right? Yeah, and after he, he mysteriously it, survives his trip back in the snow with you know having nothing. Right. So, so yeah, that's kind of like kind of a little tropey part where it's like uh, the character goes through a deep transformation and he goes through some kind of harrowing experience and he ends up going to sleep for days. In this case, it's three weeks. Yeah. Um, but um, but he also yeah. said that he he had he'd said that I want to tell you this before I forget and that you know I was a wolf and I remember tasting blood and and uh, mm -hmm. and also there was a woman uh, I think was it Marga Margareta. Uh, right, reached in into the darkness and felt his face, and she was like horrified. I think like he had a wolf's shape on his face. She senses that his face was uh, monstrous, had like thunder in it or something. Is that yeah. what they mention? Yeah, right. So, so I kind of putting all of that together, I figured, yeah, maybe he can now he can turn into a wolf for some reason. In let's see what what exactly is the part it says here. I came out of the plain and onto the mountains. The snow was thick, and as I walked, it became thicker. I had no food left or shelter except for the rocks. And it seemed, Jan, in my delirium, that I was a wolf and patted with a pack upon the snow under the white moon and tasted blood. And um, 
Okay, so he just I kind stood, of, he yeah. became more feral, it sounds like, maybe. That's yeah, his one it says, interpretation. It says, um, Margareta uh, touches his face. She hears a noise as of animals, and then she says, where are you? I heard you. And then she moves across to the shadowy figure that we discover is Jerusalem, puts her hand on his face, screams, says, what did I see? I touched this face, and it wasn't the face at all. There was fire and lightning. So hmm. that's, um, it seems like when she kind of finds him, he went through this almost harrowing bestial transformation. Yeah. Uh, maybe not just so much spiritual, but also somehow physical. And he goes through this transformation, but he emerges. In, so even yeah. though he was, he was lost, but he found himself again and he became a man. And then he goes to sleep for three weeks to recover from this horrible experience. Yeah. Um, so the fire and lightning might have been him transforming back into a human shape. Yeah, or maybe it's just a poetic way of saying that his face was troubled or something. I mean, it, yeah. it, it leaves yeah. it up to the person to interpret that uh, in the shadow. Anything is possible, right? Yeah, yeah, really interesting. I I liked reading this play a lot, and I, I was really happy that this was, you know, this was another one that had not been published before. Right. So eventually, uh, like you said, the, the cardinal hires the Dutchman to go after uh, Jerusalem and legally kill him because he wants <laughs> yeah. things to be done legally. Yeah. So he wants there to be a trial, of course, a sham trial. Right. But yeah, uh, that's what makes the term legally sort of a, a ironic or kind of a joke, because, you know, legal is just whatever they, you know, whatever they whatever sham they put on, you know, imitating a, a court or a trial. And and they try to make this betrayal between uh, Jan, the apprentice, and Jerusalem. They try to make Jan say, "Well, if if you testify against Jerusalem, we will spare you and your girlfriend. Yeah. But you have to lie. It's one of the oldest tricks that mankind ever learned was to lie. You know, yeah. from the the time that Eve said, "Oh, we the we just we didn't eat from the apple. You know, that's." Yeah. You know, that's when Lie was born. And so it reminded me as well of Frankenstein uh, in love because El Coco, right? There's a time when like El Coco's um, second in command uh, kind of turns against him at some point. Is, yeah. Am I misremembering it or no, I, I think, think I remember right. that. Yeah. Was yeah. It cock cockatoo. Cockatoo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that, so. Yeah. That's cockatoo. Cockatoo and El Coco. <laughs> So it reminded me a little bit of that. Um, so there's there's an echo of that in there. Yeah, yeah, and and um, and they were making him say things like, uh, "Oh, did he whisper the names of of demons and devils in the night?" And and they're even feeding him what devils, you know, you know. So all he has to do is say yes. He doesn't have to actually produce any kind of evidence. Just right, like, but you know, was it Belial yeah. or was it uh, you know, Abaddon? Was it in in the and um, he just said, no. It was no, a demon no. called Slipknot. <laughs> right. So anyway, that doesn't go the way they think. So they, 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 Jan refuses to testify against his friend. And that's when all hell breaks loose. And, uh, of course, eventually um, Jerusalem confronts the cardinal himself and uh, yeah, takes matters into his own hands. The, ta the, the town is overrun by wolves all of a sudden. It's that's a very Deus Ex Machina kind of thing. Yeah. So it's like the hunters in the snow actually appear. Yeah. And it's like he summons the wolves to to throw chaos into it and and and, and get himself out of the situation. And then so Jan unties him and and uh, they escape back to their church. But we never hear of of Jerusalem again after that. It's like he he does what he set out to do. He he confronts the cardinal. He destroys his power, and then he disappears from the story. He goes into somewhere else, which yeah. is kind of a thing that happens, like with Gentle and Imagica. After their work is done, the artist disappears and walks into mystery. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In this case, he goes up into the mountains. Yeah. He's an outsider. I think that's a big. Uh, that's kind of a big theme of the of the this play is that the main character that the, the artist is an outsider and that they can't be like other people. They yeah. Be he's kind of driven by the looking, vision looking in. Yeah. He, he is to be despised by the people and because of his vision. Um, so 
It's a little bit reminded me a little bit of like when uh, in Nietzsche, um, that 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 book uh, also sp uh, thus spoke Zarathustra. Zarathustra also goes up into the mountains and he comes back and he's changed. And you know he wants to to help people get in touch with a better you know condition uh, for for mankind. So it's almost like that. Like you go into the mountains and then you come down and you're wise. Just like whenever someone goes to meet the big wise man and the, and the hermit, he has to go up the mountain. It's like this this symbol for like this trial thing that you have to do. You have to not just elevate your mind, but you also have to go up the mountain and 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 reach that sort of enlightenment. Um, and that happens with him. He, his yeah. enlightenment is to become bestial, but then reemerge as human again. And he's different now. So, and he passes the torch on. You know, he he, he trained um, Jan to continue the painting, and and then Jan, and then the young soldier. I forget this. Uh, Niccolo. Niccolo. Yeah, and so Niccolo becomes the apprentice. Jan becomes the master, and uh, and Jerusalem kind of wanders off into the mountains. Yeah. It's interesting. There's a few connections here. I think Clive was reading a lot of uh, European literature at the time, and uh, and what could be seen as some sort of another thematic connection. Maybe I'm just trying to make connections where there, there's none. But there's a Dutchman in Hunters in the Snow, and Crazy Face features a character called Ullenspiegel, who was celebrated by a writer called Charles de Coster as a symbol of Flemish independence. Mm -hmm. So uh, it had to do with the whole thing about king george the third or something and like the spanish you know kings and and re religion and and and, and uh, the flemish thing so yeah so there, there's kind of this idea of the that clive was going through a lot of like european literature and and, and you know using some of the stuff to inform his own yeah. theater and, and his theater theater style and the characters um that he was putting in there but yeah, but like you said, the Dutchman is in this one. He's not. He's not a hero at all. In this one, he's a reanimated corpse, and the uh, evil, deformed clown called Cockpiece ends up yeah. dropping his bag, and his bag is full of snakes. Which I guess it's a, it's a metaphor for being the devil. So and, and he had uh, the, and he had um, some. Every once in a while, he would pull out like a severed hand or a severed leg. Yeah. <laughs> out of his bag. Out of yeah. It's like, I'm just, I'm just training. I'm just training for the torture. And it's like hitting yeah. the leg with a hammer, like breaking <laughs> the bones. God. Uh, yeah. 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 Really creepy clown. Uh, but uh, there've been clowns in, uh, in a lot of Clive's plays and, uh, and then a creepy clown in, in dread. Mm hmm. So at the end, after the Cardinal dies, um, and I'm sorry for spoilers. Maybe we should put a spoiler alert at the beginning of the uh, yeah. the episode, just I'll, so people. I'll put that uh, in the introduction. Yeah, that's great. Um, so once once the cardinal dies, um, he ends up going into posterity in a very different note than has than as he lived, because they say, well, you know. Okay, the cardinal was a horrible guy, but now he's dead, and we're going to use him as you know it's the old thing right when people die they all become saints you, you don't speak ill of the dead yeah in some way so they're like well we want to make sure that we turn his death into a place of pilgrimage and uh we can we can uh direct people into the good parts of religion and and get inspired by it and I'm yeah. like, how are you going to do that? He was a terrible person that threw the land in like an inquisition. Well, and this, but, this messenger is interesting too. I wonder like what kind of power he has or who he is. But he he comes along and says, yeah, this guy didn't really do us much good. He was a, he was not a good person. He was pretty terrible. But you've done us a great service because in his death, now he can become a martyr and a saint and draw people to this church. Right, and that's how they, and again they hire. Jan, who's now become the master and mm -hmm. taken Niccolo as his apprentice, and he can continue work in the church where they were doing the fresco, and he can do the ceiling now and the walls and all that stuff and, and, and create this beautiful place where people can go and uh, feel inspired um, and the around a guy. Yeah. Go ahead. Around a around a, a buried corpse that's a giant fraud. Yeah, well, and and the uh, that's the ironic part of this is that this this person that was a fraud and a horrible person and not godly at all, 
uh, was elevated to a saint, which was the whole, which was um, Jerus Jerusalem's whole purpose of his fresco, was showing people that an ordinary person has it within them to become a saint. And then this yeah. hor this horrible guy, it, by the end, becomes a saint, you know, by getting, basically, he got stabbed with a, a pitchfork, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Jerusalem killed him and then left uh, and then uh, went out into the mountains. Yeah, his job is done. Yeah. Um, so, again, you know, I mentioned the state and the church using money to commission artists, and uh, that's what happens again at the end. Um, yeah. That's something that even through history, then the, the, when when the middle class started becoming more rich, the bourgeois started doing the same thing. You know, they would make their little palaces and commission painters to make a painting of themselves and stuff like that and uh, make their own little chapel, private chapel or something. So it's interesting because that doesn't seem to have changed a lot. You still have that going on with the Vatican. And you still have that going on with, with rich people ordering, you know, c commissions from artists. Um, the queen gets her painting done by, by a big artist every year. Oh. Um, and now you have um, – interesting that now – the other day I was looking at a video, a live video on YouTube. SpaceX was announcing this Japanese billionaire wants to start a project with Elon Musk called Dear Moon. So it's, it's, it's going to be about sending artists to the moon. They want to do a, another mission of going civilians to the moon, but now they want to send a graphic designer, a dancer, a photographer, uh, a painter – and this is called Dear Moon. So they want to do that in the next few years. Wow. And this is basically another one of those things where they're they're trying to shape people's minds and dreams by sending artists to the moon in order to seduce our culture into seeing the moon as a destination or a destiny. Yeah. <laughs> like a springboard into moving out into the universe, like Mars and beyond. So it's it's again serving a political purpose. You know, art is political. It's a political view of the world by the artist. Even at its most abstract, I think it becomes kind of a filter, a new reality of looking at the world. But even an abstraction eventually can provide your brain with a backdrop to hang your own interpretations, your own ideas on it. And uh, I think that's that's what happens here. Um, art as a way of changing the world through art, inspiring people, changing the flow of culture using art. And if it's done by an institution, then it's political and it's 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 going to, you know, ultimately serve an agenda. Yeah. And so uh, sometimes poisons the well or. Yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. Like like movie producers that that have their own notes for what they would like to see in the movie. And... Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if I, I, I thought it was a great play. Um very, very um, – there's a lot of themes here that I was very struck by, and I, I feel like Clive holds some of these themes very close to his heart. I posted a picture on my Facebook of one of the pages where, yeah. um, where uh, Jerusalem is talking about w the role of the artist, um, and, you know, it, it's, it's – he says, why shouldn't men eventually be gods? We're supposed to be made in his image, aren't we? And then Jan says, no, no, that's dangerous. That's a dangerous way to think. And he says, what's dangerous to my mortal soul? I'm going to be condemned for believing that I have more power in me than God would have me know. And, um, yeah, so he says here, uh, the artist must be a man apart. He can't live like other men. He can't afford the simple luxuries of a warm house and a wife. And then, and then Jan says, but that doesn't work, Jerusalem. The visions, if they're visions, pass them by. Nobody understands them. And it says, they will. It may not be now. Perhaps I will be dead before they understand. But they will. We have been given a power, Jan. We must go have the strength enough to use it. You must have the courage, too. The courage to stand apart, reject the domestic life, the safe existence in the valley. We must climb the mountains and shout what we know from the tops. So I think that Clive has done that a little bit in his life. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's 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 done lots of visions and images and stuff. Some of it is still like probably tucked away in a garage and maybe has been seen by just a handful of people and they will stay forever. You know, the, the Imaginer series of books by the Clive Barker Archive is is uh, putting those images out there in the hands of the fans and people who 
who love Clive Barker and may and some who may not have known that much about his painting. So that's one way of of leaving his work behind um, and and making it, you know, effective, re remotely affect people's ideas and and minds which is the magic of art, I believe. It's like someone writes a book in a room and then that book gets published and someone across the world buys that book and reads it and for a couple of days goes into this different reality, gets fed different ideas, um, different different views of the world. Um, and that kind of different cir visions. circles around back to this play because, it, he, he, you know, he... he he likened it to, you know, falling into the painting or falling into the creator's world in this in this painting. And, and uh, he kind of that inspired him to, to to make this play. And he and he said, you know, a big part of that's a big image of his a big recurring image of his is, is a person literally falling into a world like we world or or Imagica. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That that yeah. that scene where uh, that scene where uh, Cal Mooney is trying to catch the pigeon. In uh, yeah. what's what's the name of the old lady? I forgot. Oh, Betty. Oh gosh. Yeah, I can't remember. He was it. Yeah, and he was in her house, and he's yeah. sort of reaching out the window, and he slips and falls out the window. And then it's like he he falls in slow motion, and he sees like the, the carpet was rolled up in the backyard by the movers, and all of a sudden he feels like he's falling onto a landscape, and you know that's 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 amazing. Yeah, and Clive has did mention that he was affected by Hunters in the Snow by Bruegel. Because he looked at the painting and he felt like he was almost going into the painting, and yeah. um, so that's that's fantastic. I mean, I've been to the Louvre in Paris, and uh, there are some gigantic canvases there. Um, yeah, you can just sit in front of those. You can just sit yourself on the floor in the gallery, and just sit in front of that, and you can just look at it for like a couple of minutes, and it's like it's it's pulling you in. So it, yeah, that's a, that's an amazing feeling. That would be that would be awesome to see. Yeah. All right. Well, and originally we were going to also talk about Colossus with this, but I think it was nicer to uh, to to give it its own episode. And also, Colossus is like 150 pages, so it should also probably have its own its own episode. Sure, uh, we can bring that back for for a, a near future episode if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, in this podcast, having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com, where we have news, features, reviews, and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and every other place you can find podcasts. Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.